Hello everyone, welcome to um, All the Nourishing Things. I'm Lindsay and today I'm so excited to have a guest to interview for the blog. This is Dr. David Beckett. He is an interventional radiologist in London at the Whiteley Clinic. Dr. Beckett also happens to be the doctor who performed my pelvic vein embolization for pelvic congestion syndrome in June of 2019. And I'm happy to report that I'm doing 100% better than I was before I had my embolization. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Beckett, he is an interventional radiologist working at the Whiteley Clinic in London. He trained at St. George's Hospital Medical School and completed his basic training in London, followed by his radiology residency in Birmingham. He underwent a two-year higher fellowship training in interventional radiology in Sheffield Vascular Institute. He specializes in vascular interventional radiology and has a subspecialty interest in venous intervention and pelvic vein embolization. He has been performing pelvic vein embolization since 2009. David, welcome. Hi, Lindsay. <laughs> so glad to have you here. Um, I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule and all the craziness that's happening in the world right now to join me to provide a resource um, that to my knowledge doesn't exist on the internet yet. So are you ready to dive in? Yeah, let's go for it. Awesome. So can you just explain to us what is an interventional radiologist and how are you different from a normal radiologist? Okay, so certainly in the UK, what we've got is we've got two arms of radiology. Um, one is the diagnostic side, um, and they specialize in CT, MR, ultrasound, um, and, and, and they'll specialize in certain areas. So it might be uroradiology, uh, cardiac or thoracic radiology. Um, interventional radiologists, um, they specialize in minimally invasive uh, therapy, essentially which uses uh, real-time imaging techniques such as uh, live x-rays, ultrasound, to perform image-guided surgery effectively, um, which is minimally invasive. Um, and that, certainly in the UK, um, and I know in, in the US as well, will involve higher training and higher fellowship training to gain those skills. Now, it certainly can be that that can be a radiologist that's performing that, with this higher training, or it could be in other parts of the world, cardiologists, vascular surgeons. At the end of the day, it's, it's about training. And if you've got the training to perform the procedure, you're safe and you can perform the procedure. Okay, well, thank you for, for explaining that because I didn't know the difference. <laughs> so you mentioned special training. And since this um, video is about how to find a qualified interventional radiologist to treat pelvic congestion syndrome, Specifically, can you tell our viewers what special training is needed to treat pelvic veins? Yeah, so you, what you what you need to, to perform any sort of any level of interventional radiology is you need your basic skills. So you need your basic skills that you get within your training, and that's your wires, your catheters, knowing how to deploy deploy coils, for example, and um, stent. And then you work from there. You, you've got your foundations and then you, you'll find your technique, you'll find your subspecialty interest and you'll build. Um, and for pelvic vein embolization, um, part, part of it, because we know that you treat ovarian veins as well as internal iliac veins, um, and the ovarian vein anatomy is exactly the same as uh, male testicular vein anatomy. So, of course, you'll start by learning how to perform testicular vein embolization, for example. Um, and then you'll get a good understanding of the wires, the catheters that you need for that, and the coils that you need to perform embolization of the testicular veins. And in actual fact, performing ovarian vein embolization is no different at all, um, or shouldn't be, uh, than performing a testicular vein embolization. But, of course, what we, we also know is that the the veins that are involved in that pattern of reflux that we see with um, pelvic congestion syndrome uh, also involve the internal iliacs. Um, and that's a whole different level of training that's needed um, with regards to that. Uh, so when you're doing your fellowship, your residency, um, that level of basic training, certainly when I underwent mine, um, there was no training in iliac vein embolization at all. So, you know, there's a lot of reading um, about the anatomy. Um, and so you have to understand the anatomy of the pelvic veins. 
um, and in particular where the pudendal veins, the obturator veins, the parauterine veins, the arcuate veins, where these veins are. Because unfortunately, it's not like just putting a catheter into, into a vein, injecting some contrast, and the contrast goes out and you see the vein branches. Because actually, veins are the opposite. They will push the contrast back towards you. So you almost need to know that you're in the vein before you inject the contrast to prove that you're then in the vein. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, um, you know, th there was a lot of finding my own way um, mm -hmm. in, in the early days. Uh, but certainly now there are enough people that are doing it that you can, that you can contact the, the medical um, device uh, companies. Um, and I think I should be very honest and say as well that I proctor for Boston Scientific and I also uh, proct proctor for um, Cook Medical. Um, so there are those conflicts of interest, obviously, um, if, if I'm mentioning those companies. Uh, but clearly, for example, in the UK, those companies are very approachable. Um, and if you want a uh, proctorship uh, to be able to go through either the, the, the basic sort of physiology understanding, or indeed you want someone to do the procedure with you, supervise you, um, and, and get the training that way, then we are available for that. Uh, but what I would say is that the learning curve, particularly for the pelvic veins, from what I've seen in terms of teaching other people, is quite high. And, and I think before you even start getting familiar with the pelvic veins and the pelvic venous anatomy, I've found that most people, it takes between 20 to 50 cases just to get comfortable, really, wow. um, in, in this new anatomy, because it is completely new to most people. And it was to me. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned the, uh, how the veins push the contrast back up. I just want to remind people, for those who don't remember anatomy class, that veins pump the blood back up to the heart. <laughs> so that's, that's what we're talking about here, are the, the structures that pump the blood back up, not the arteries that carry the blood down, correct? Correct. And, and, and what I found quite quite interesting is that despite the fact that women can have a huge amount of reflux so therefore when you inject the contrast you would expect the contrast to reflux into these veins you don't always see that mm. um, and, and until you're physically into that vein and you inject then you see the the more significant reflux um, mm -hmm. and, and where it where it's then tracking okay wow thanks for clarifying that so then it's safe to say that treating pelvic varicose veins, and, and again, for those who are either new to this or just learning, we're talking about um, the valves and the veins that push the blood back to the heart have essentially broken, for lack of a better word. And rather than the blood being pumped back towards the heart, it's, being, it's falling back down into the vein because of gravity, which is why many people with pelvic congestion syndrome experience worsened symptoms when they're up and moving around versus when they're lying down because when they're up and moving around their veins are having to work against gravity is that accurate <laughs> yeah i, I mean it, it is i mean it, it's best to sort of strip it down um, as simple as you you can think um, and certainly having an element in the legs you have an element of reflux and you have an element of blood pooling um, and it's that blood pooling sometimes which is the congested feeling yeah. Um, within within the pelvic veins that contributes to the symptoms as well. Yeah, so then you would say that treating pelvic varicose veins is different than treating like leg varicose veins. It, it, it is, and in many ways it's very, it's very similar okay. in the sense that, in the sense that when, when you're treating any varicose vein, whether it be in the legs or in the pelvis, um, you're, you're essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to kill the vein wall to cause transmural death to the vein wall. The vein will then shrink. You'll get fibrosis, apoptosis, which is a fancy medical word, um, whereby the, the, the vein then just sort of gets eaten up effectively by, by the body and you're left with this fibrous structure. Um, so no vein at all effectively. Um, and in the legs, what you're doing is you're injecting um, a sclerosin, which will cause either a chemical burn to the vein wall, or you're using thermal ablation techniques such as laser radiofrequency ablation. Again, within the pelvic veins, you're to a degree causing a physical blockade by placing a coil in 
but actually the predominant effect comes because what happens is the vein will go into spasm because it's a foreign body, this coil. And as the vein spasms over the coil itself, you then get the effects. So what happens over a long period of time is you get fibrosis and destruction of that vein. Um, and if you then go and do a laparotomy or a laparoscopy, say in someone who's had pelvic vein embolization, you can physically see these coils and there's a very fine fibrous membrane that you'll see over them. And I think if you're not used to seeing that, sometimes people think that the coil is actually poking out into the peritoneal cavity or it looks loose in there, but it's not. It's just got this very, very fine fibrous layer lying over it. So the embolization essentially, um, once the coil goes into the pelvic vein, uh, I remember Dr. Whiteley explaining that it, it pisses the vein off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it hits it. Yeah, so then, but... So why, um, why do you treat pelvic veins with coils versus leg veins being treated with the, the foaming agent that causes the chemical burn? So obviously in the legs, you, you can compress the vein. So you, you can cause a chemical burn, you can cause a thermal burn to the, to the vein wall, um, and then you can put um, either tumescence and compression on, um, and that will oppose the vein walls together as well, and you've got transmural death. Within the pelvis, you can't do that. So you, you can't do thermal ablation, for example, within the pelvis, because you can't inject your tumescence, which is this cold fluid around the vein, so that when you burn the, the inside of the vein, the heat doesn't dissipate out into the tissues and cause surrounding damage, mm. which is why you do it in the legs with tumescence. In the pelvis, if you use thermal ablation, the heat would simply go straight out the vein wall and it would damage surrounding structures. One, for example, um, in the ovarian vein, maybe the ureter. So you could end up with significant thermal ablation to the ureter, um, which is what you don't want. Right. <laughs> okay, good to know. <laughs> so as an interventional radiologist, um, do you actually diagnose pelvic congestion syndrome or does someone else diagnose it and you treat it? So I personally um, don't diagnose it. Um, I, will, I will treat the, the condition. Um, obviously, as a radiologist, I can if I want, and I have the skills to do that. But certainly at the Whiteley Clinic, um, what we've done is we've, we've developed very subspecialist interests. Um, and we've got some, probably some of the best sonographers I've ever come across, really. Um, and they're doing it day in day out and they have been for sort of decades mm -hmm. and their level of experience is huge um, which is of course one of the problems is that diagnosing pelvic reflux by using transvaginal and transabdominal scanning is quite an art and it is quite a skill and it takes it takes a lot to develop that mm -hmm. and in many ways it's probably more difficult than doing the procedure itself wow <laughs> but of course, elsewhere in the world, pe people as interventional radiologists um, w will diagnose it. Um, and and that, that's how they've set up their practice. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, where, where I work, we're, we're separated from that. And we have the sonographers who do the diagnosis for us. Yeah, so it's interesting that you talk about the sonographers at the Whiteley Clinic being the best in the world. Uh, one of the reasons that I chose the Whiteley Clinic was after doing hours and hours of research, as well as visiting an interventional radiologist here in the United States and leaving my appointment sort of feeling completely defeated and hopeless. Um, that's, that's when I found the Whiteley Clinic and I was so impressed. And it seemed like everything that I was reading from the Whiteley Clinic um, was so different from everything that I was learning in the United States. And in the United States, the Holdstock-Harrison protocol of sonography is not yet being used anywhere that I'm aware of. But there, so, so doctors are still telling patients that the best way to diagnose pelvic congestion syndrome is with CT scans, MRIs, um, intravascular ultrasound, uh, laparoscopy, and um, as, a, as a doctor who treats pelvic congestion, I'm curious, have you seen CT scan, MRI, laparoscopy, those things 
be as accurate or as successful as the transvaginal, transabdominal ultrasound. So I think, I think it'd be wrong to say that MR and CT, uh, for example, doesn't, doesn't have a role. Um, it certainly has got a role for us in, in being able to help if patients, it, it's looking as though a patient may have a compression, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, can get, we can get pictures using MR and we can get pictures using CT. Um, there's, there's certainly a role for it, but, but one of the papers that was published out of the, the Whiteley Clinic um, showed that actually just looking at the ovarian vein and the ovarian vein diameter, the actual diameter of the vein did not correlate with the presence or absence of reflux. Mm -hmm. So you could have a large vein that wasn't refluxing or a large vein that was refluxing. So taking a static, a static picture with a CT or an MR wouldn't necessarily be useful in saying that the patient had reflux. It would just be saying, it would be just useful to say, actually, this, this vein is big. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and sometimes there's that inference that if the vein is big, it's abnormal. Mm -hmm. um, but it, every, everyone essentially will have their own practice um, and they will have developed knowledge around how they're diagnosing um, and how they're going to, going to treat patients. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're wrong and we're right but i would just say that the there's certainly the research that we've and your know, marks published through the whiteley clinic suggests that the transvaginal scan is is actually the gold standard mm -hmm. um, and there was a published article in that in pubmed um, and that the ovarian vein diameter um bared no resemblance in that study uh, it, its diameter to the presence or absence of reflux okay yeah, so um, I've shared my story on my website in another blog post about how I was diagnosed with pelvic congestion. And it's interesting that I was initially diagnosed with a CT scan. Um, but the pain that I've been having and the duration of it caused me to think that I was experiencing a kidney stone or something. And mm. um, when I went to the doctor, I actually ended up going in three times and then just telling me that it was you know, nothing or um, mysterious pelvic pain and it would probably go away or um, a UTI, despite the fact that they could find, you know, if my urine wouldn't culture bacteria. So I got all these different things. And then finally, I was just in so much pain that I went to the emergency room, they did a CT scan and noted that my left ovarian vein uh, appeared to suggest pelvic congestion. So obviously, that image was a still image. It wasn't in live time the way that sonography is and all they could see was an ex expanded diameter of the vein right mm -hmm. and, and i think with, with the left ovarian vein that that's slightly different because of the way um when contrast is injected into a patient to do a ct examination and how it returns back from the kidney you can get some information if there's reflux of contrast into the left ovarian vein as well as the size mm -hmm. but what you can't get um information on necessarily is if that is happening in the right ovarian vein or the internal iliac veins but you can get that um in the left ovarian vein and of course the other reason that ct and mr can be useful is of course is that patients we need to rule out other causes Sure. Um, or, or, or problems. Right. Um, and, and actually, a, a lot of women, especially post childbirth, will, will have reflux within mm -hmm. the internal iliac veins, within the ovarian veins, and they'll be asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. they, won't have any, they won't have any physical symptoms because of that. Therefore, you can't just say because someone has reflux in those veins that that reflux is causing the problem. So it is very important not to just jump straight to this idea that uh, you've, got, you've got reflux in these veins, it must be pelvic congestion syndrome. Mm -hmm. You don't want to miss the, the other important causes of chronic pelvic pain. You don't want to miss um, pelvic floor issues. You don't want to miss uh, pelvic inflammatory disease. You don't want to, to miss any of the other gynecological or gastrointestinal causes sure. whereby 
you know, that there's a, that there is something else. Because once these coils are in, they're in. They're you, in. You, you, you can't get these coils out. Right. Um, right. Certainly not the way they went in. Um, and actually, if you did have to take them out for any reason, it, it would be quite a, a big procedure to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. My next question, you mentioned, well, before we talk about compressions, I, I do want to say, um, I noticed that you pointed out that on the CT, um, that you can see the left ovarian vein, the size of it, that the contrast dye can cause inflammation and show that, but you couldn't necessarily see it in the right ovarian vein or the iliac veins. And so if it's cool with you, I'd like to talk about my personal case for a moment. Um, in my case, the only thing that was mentioned to me from a CT scan was a, an enlarged ovarian vein, left ovarian vein. But when I came over to the Whiteley Clinic and Angie White did my sonogram, it wasn't just the left ovarian vein. It turned out that both of my internal iliac, iliac veins were also refluxing and you treated both iliac veins and the left ovarian vein. Um, so I'd like to talk about why it's so important to not skip over the iliac veins and it's my understanding and you can totally correct me if I'm wrong it's my understanding that many interventional radiologists um, because of the training needed to treat the iliac veins will only treat the ovarian veins and they don't actually treat the iliac veins because it's a whole specialty so can you just can you talk about the importance of the iliac veins in pelvic congestion syndrome so I mean, what, what, what we've seen certainly in the, in the studies that we've, we've performed is that one of the most common, commonest, should we say, patterns of reflux that we see, whether it be women presenting with varicose veins in the legs or pelvic congestion, um, is left ovarian and internal iliac uh, venous reflux. Um, now, that being said, and what we've already discussed um, which is that, of course, women can have reflux within the internal iliac veins and be asymptomatic, for example, you can't necessarily jump to the conclusion that that is necessarily causing the symptoms. Mm -hmm. However, what, what we believe is that actually you, we should be treating all of the areas of reflux to get a sustained result. Mm -hmm. um, but there are different schools of thought. Um, one's not necessarily... I'm, you know, I don't want to be critical in, in people that, that don't believe it as such, because what some people believe in is that actually they'll, they'll do a staged approach. And therefore, what they can do is they can treat the left ovarian vein in the first instant and see how the patient improves. If they get a symptomatic result and the symptoms disappear and that reflux is gone in the left ovarian vein, great. If not, then those clinicians may decide to move forward and then look at reflux within the internal iliac veins. Mm -hmm. Certainly when you do the venogram, what you can see is you can see huge sometimes um, parauterine veins. And of course, these parauterine veins, pudendal veins, they, they can contribute to quite a large plexus that is paravaginal and paraurethral. And again, when the sonographers do their scanning, and they're using a transvaginal probe, and as they come out with the tra transvaginal probe and they tilt it towards the urethra, you can actually see this, this huge amount of periurethral um, reflux occurring. Um, and certainly that is, we think, why patients can get um, a lot of urinary tract symptoms with pelvic congestion syndrome. I like to think that patients who've got um, varicose veins in their legs they get aching and irritability in the legs because of these veins. And actually, if you just say, well, you've now got veins in your pelvis, you're going to have aching and irritability within the pelvis. Mm -hmm. And how will that then show itself? Well, that will show itself with irritable bowel, um, irritable bladder, uh, pain on intercourse, and of course, chronic pelvic pain, um, which is worse when patients stand up and it's relieved to a degree when, when they lie flat. Um, and that's clearly the classical presentation. Yeah, and also um, for me and other women that I've talked to, there's a degree of bloating that they can experience yeah. off and on. For me, it wasn't a constant thing. I'd go a few days and I'd be fine, and then I'd 
have one day where I would look five months pregnant, you know, it just was really weird. So the, the bloating was a big one. And then also just this feeling of, um, heaviness or dragging in the pelvis, almost like there's a, you're trying to carry around a weight. Um, I remember that being a really uncomfortable part of it. And the, the ovari left ovarian vein symptoms seemed to be more on the, you know, like the left side that kind of went down around kind of towards the kidney on the left side, but the, the veins that you're talking about, that big cluster of the periuterine veins is what I feel likely contributed to that just achy, dragging, heavy feeling. And certainly when, when you perform venography, there is, a, there is a connection that's directly from the left ovarian <clears throat> into the left internal iliac vein that you can see as well. Okay. Now I know what some, some clinicians do in other centers uh, abroad is they can get very, they, they, they use a microcatheter and they go even deeper into the left ovarian vein and they go around effectively almost into the internal iliac branch. Mm -hmm. So I think in those situations, they're almost treating the left internal iliac branch anyway. Yeah. Um, but what they're not doing necessarily all the time is they're treating the lower branches, the, the pudendal branches. Um, and we certainly see that by embolizing those, we, we, we get an improvement um, in the in, in the periurethral symptoms. And that's what we're aiming to do there. Yeah, I, I can absolutely say that there was an improvement, <laughs> a noticeable improvement. And you did my left and right, um, my pudendal vein and my um, obturator. obturator. Yeah. yeah, you did both of those for me, left and right, and then the left ovarian. So, okay, you mentioned compressions earlier and how CT or MRI can be helpful with finding compressions. Uh, the two compressions, or maybe they're the only compressions that I'm familiar with, and certainly the, the pelvic congestion syndrome community are familiar with, is Nutcracker syndrome and May Thurner syndrome. Can you talk about those? Yeah, so I mean, th there are other compressions. Well, okay. Another one, for example, maybe MALS, median arcuate ligament syndrome. Um, but certainly the two that get spoken about the most is Nutcracker syndrome um, and May Thurner syndrome. Um, and May Thurner syndrome is where the iliac vein, the common iliac vein, is compressed. And the compression generally comes about because of one of the arteries that's nearby. And that causes by compressing on the iliac vein, a reduction in, in the venous return, almost like a physical blockage to the, to the blood coming up from the, from the left leg. Mm -hmm. um, and it finds a different route because of course, it's a bit too tight to get through this narrowing. So the blood tends to then bypass into the internal iliac vein and it crosses to the opposite internal iliac vein and then up. So what that does is it, is it causes an almost like a, hyperdynamic situation, increased flow within the pelvic veins, mm -hmm. and obviously some congestion within the pelvic veins. So there are cases where patients present with pelvic congestion, but there's an actual physical cause for it in that it's not reflux, it's simply this bypassing of blood because of a primary cause, which in, in this case is compression of the iliac vein, May Thurner syndrome. Mm -hmm. So therefore, by relieving that obstruction, the Mayferna syndrome, by placing a stent, um, then the blood can return normally from the left leg, not bypass through the internal iliac veins, and their symptoms may improve. They may not, and they still may need embolization, but if you embolize the veins within the pelvis in the presence of a, a narrowing on the left side, then the blood can't get through that sort of, you know, mess, mess of veins in the pelvis anymore because you've now embolized it and it can't get through the narrowing because of the Mayferna. So afterwards, the patient feels worse in the fact that they come back and say, well, now I've got a left swollen leg uh, yeah. and I'm getting pa pain in my left leg. You've made me worse. Um, and you then have to immediately realize that this is, this is background Mayferna syndrome. So I think when you, when you do your diagnostic scans, and, and this is something that's rapidly developed, I would say, over the last seven, eight, eight years, is it used to be a case of just do a transvaginal scan, look for the reflux, embolize. 
Likewise, now we've moved on to different protocols where we do transvaginal and transabdominal scanning to look for a potential methana. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, if they have got a methana, we may then do other, other imaging, CT, MR, to get more detail about what, what we're dealing with. Um, now, nutcracker syndrome um, is, is far more complex. So I think the first thing to say is methana syndrome is rare but we see it and we see it a few times a year. Nutcracker syndrome is completely different. Um, and it seems when you read the literature, you, you, you go to international meetings that it varies. Some people are, see, are seeing it very frequently, whereas other people are seeing it once, once a year, once every five years. Um, but they're still performing the same number of cases. It's not like they're doing less and they're just not seeing it because they're not doing enough. So there's this huge variation. Now, I think it's important when you're dealing with nutcracker to separate it into nutcracker phenomenon and nutcracker syndrome. So nutcracker pho- what nutcracker phenomenon is, is it simply means that there's narrowing of the left renal vein. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now, if that subsequently causes symptoms, then that's nutcracker syndrome. Now, the, the reason that it's important to distinguish the two, I think, is because certainly as a radiologist, we perform CT, we perform MRI scans for all different reasons. Patients who've got cancer, patients who have got um, abdominal perforation, diverticular disease, whole different number of causes. And when you're reporting a CT scan or an MRI scan of the abdomen and pelvis and you look at the, 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 the renal vein as it, as it joins the IVC, you'll frequently see that it's narrowed. But these patients don't have symptoms. So you can't suddenly say that 30% of patients who you're doing a CT scan have all got nutcracker syndrome because they can't. So it's a phenomenon that you see the narrowing, mm-hmm. but it's the syndrome that then is take, takes the, you know, the, the presentation of left loin pain, hematuria, um, those, those symptoms because of narrowing of this part of the vein. And mm-hmm. the part of the vein that narrows is called the mesoaortic segment um, of the renal vein. Uh, very fancy words, I know. Um, but... It may simply be narrowed because it's being, it's underfilling. So the, the way I like to think of it is if you've got your kidney and the blood is draining from the kidney through the, the renal vein back into the IVC and then back up to the heart. Now, actually, if you've got a narrowing of this, of this vein as it, as it joins, there is no way of knowing necessarily if that narrowing that you're seeing either it be on CT or ultrasound is because it's underfilled so there's simply not enough blood going through it to open it up Mm -hmm. or there's there's compression on it so at the Whiteley Clinic what we've developed is is a is a way of looking a bit more closely at that segment of the renal vein and specifically in patients where they've got reflux going down the ovarian vein so if the, if the blood is coming out of the kidney and going down the ovarian vein, it's not going through this narrowed segment. So therefore, it's probably just underfilling, or that's the theory. So if you then tilt the patient so their head down and their feet are up, what you'll see is you'll see the blood come back now from that ovarian vein. And if you wait, say, five, ten minutes, and then scan the diameter of that mesoaortic segment again, what you'll see is sometimes is you'll see that it will then distend up. So actually that narrowing, that nutcracker phenomenon that you are going to call a nutcracker syndrome isn't at all. It's simply the dynamics of the way the blood is. Blood will find the path of least resistance. And if you've got huge reflux within the ovarian vein, it will simply go down there. Um, so, so, so because of that, I think that the, it's difficult to know how frequent in the community nutcracker syndrome truly is. Um, 
some people don't even believe in it. Um, I, I do believe in it. Um, but I think it, it's more rare than what, what we think. Okay. Yeah. So um, I've, I've mentioned in the past, there's several pelvic congestion syndrome Facebook support groups. And if you go and poke around in those support groups, you find kind of an overwhelming number of people who you, they can't even talk about pelvic congestion syndrome without talking about Nutcracker and how many of these women have had stents placed because they had Nutcracker syndrome or say they had Nutcracker syndrome, but they weren't diagnosed with what you're describing as the tilt table, which is the whole stock Harrison protocol of ultrasound. They were diagnosed with a CT scan or an MRI. So can you talk about the, um, I believe Dr. Whiteley calls it the pseudo nutcracker. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so that's what I was describing. Okay, there. So, okay. it's, so the, the, basically it looks like a nutcracker, mm -hmm. but it's not because when you tilt the patient back and that vein opens up again, it, it was to do with the flow. So therefore we're saying then therefore that was pseudo nutcracker um, rather than true nutcracker. Um, but the consequences of course of missing a nutcracker and embolizing say the ovarian vein in the presence of a true nutcracker would mean that the patient's symptoms could deteriorate quite significantly. They mm -hmm. could end up with a renal vein thrombosis mm -hmm. um, and pain on that left side. So it is, it is important to, to look at these things and it is important to rule these, these compressions out. Um, and it is very important to rule them out. Sure, and the, the ultrasound that they do at the Whiteley Clinic checks for both Nutcracker and Mayferner, correct? It does, but it's important to also mention, of course, is that these, all of these tests have got a sensitivity and a specificity associated with them. So there is no test that can say you 100% don't have Nutcracker. Sure. You 100% don't have Mayferner syndrome. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to build a picture of likelihood mm -hmm. that it's not that. So on the balance of probability, this is pseudo Nutcracker because it opens up when you do the tilt test. So it's yeah. unlikely to be a true Nutcracker. Sure. And, and okay. that's what you're trying to get over to the patient, to a patient. Right. So what, what about when you flip the scenario, what about someone who actually didn't have a true nutcracker, but because they weren't tilted, they were just diagnosed and then treated, um, you know, with a CT or MRI and then treated in a venogram, they were given a stent and they really didn't have nutcracker syndrome. What happens then? You, you, well, I mean, you can't tell. Okay. They, they could have, they, you know, they, they could have had true nut, nutcracker. It's, I mean, what some people do, of course, is some people, it's, it, it's not just the case of you've got a narrowed segment, therefore, certainly in the UK, um, we don't just say you've got a narrowed segment, therefore you've got nutcracker syndrome, we're going to put a stent in. Mm -hmm. There are other, other things that we would, we would do with patients where if we felt as though this was a nutcracker, we would refer them on to... Uh, nephrologists, we would refer them on to um, specialist centres mm -hmm. um, with urologists and uh, another separate group of interventional radiologists who would probably do pressure studies within that renal vein as well and they'd look for pressure drops across that narrowing to, to further interrogate it before you would put a stent. You wouldn't just say you've got a narrowing in, in, the, in the renal vein, let's put a stent in. Okay. Okay. I mean, this is how we, this is our, of course, how, how I'm talking is what our practice is right. at, at my hospital and, right. and in the UK. Very uh, but, it's, it, but it's very, very different across the world, yeah. obviously. Very important to make that distinction. <laughs> um, okay. Do, so do you actually treat Nutcracker and Mayferner or is that someone else who does that? So, so I personally don't treat Nutcracker. Um, the hospital that I work in, um, we refer to a regional centre if we think patients have got Nutcracker syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, we do treat Mayferna, um, and I've certainly had several cases where they've presented with pelvic congestion, and we've we placed the stent in. Um, the stent by itself hasn't 100% relieved patient symptoms, and they've had to go on and had and have embolisation as well. Um, 
but I've seen several cases from elsewhere in the world um, where I've been shown where patients have had methane and they've had embolization, the left leg gets worse. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore that, that should be triggering, is there an underlying me- methane syndrome? Okay. Um, but even, even a perfect ultrasound sometimes can miss a methane syndrome, of course. So yeah. it's always important to know that these conditions exist. So when patients come back for follow-up, if, if they're not behaving as you would expect, that you, that you look into these as possible, possible causes. Okay. All right. Are you, are you cool if we pivot to talking about um, things that patients can learn or try to find out from their doctors when they're trying to find a qualified interventional radiologist to treat their pelvic congestion syndrome? Is it, can we pivot that direction? We can, we can, we can pivot that direction. Okay. <laughs> All right. And, and, I, and I mean, I, I, I think the, the question is the same as the question for, for any condition. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't think it's any different for pelvic congestion than it is if you're going and having a hysterectomy, for example, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I would always, um, this is me personally, of course, but I would always ask the, the person that's going to be performing the procedure, um, how long they've been doing it for, <laughs> yeah. um, how, how, how many, how many cases they've, they've done, mm-hmm. um, how, what, what their, what their numbers are. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying if you've only done 50 and you've, someone else has done 500, that there'll be a huge difference. Um, but of course, the more you do, the more you'll understand as well about the complications. Mm-hmm. So I think it, it's how long you've been doing it, uh, how many you've done, um, and also tell me a little bit about the, the associated complications. Mm-hmm. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm always a little wary when people say I've never had any complications. Um, you know, uh, you, you, there's an argument to say that if you haven't had any complications, you haven't had, done enough. Yeah. Um, but, but there's also obviously that balance between clearly, you know, you, you don't want to have a huge number of complications. Um, and I, I think certainly with, um, with pelvic congestion syndrome and pelvic embolization, I, I, would, I would want to know about coil migration rates, for example, mm-hmm. um, and, and also what the process of follow-up is as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so with regards to the follow-up, it's, it's very much a case of if I get improvement, fantastic. If I don't get improvement, what would you advise? Yeah. Or if my symptoms got worse, what would you advise? And I think just having an understanding of a clear management pathway is, is important. And that's important for, for every condition, I think, as well. Yeah. So, um, when, you know, I only have my own experience to talk about. So when I went to the American interventional radiologist, I did ask him how many pelvic vein embolizations do you perform per year? And, uh, he sort of nonchalantly, Oh, three or four. So can you, can you talk about that number? And, and I did chat about this with Dr. Whiteley and, and his response was in what other field of surgery is performing three or four per year an acceptable you know, would, do you want to go to the heart surgeon who performs three heart surgeries per year? Do you want to go, to, you know, so can you talk about, um, you know, how many do you perform per year? And why is finding a doctor who has performed more important to minimize risk, to get the best outcome, and all of those reasons? I think, I, I certainly think there's enough research out there to show that high, high volume centers have better results. And I'm not talking about pelvic vein embolization here. I'm just talking in general. Yeah. So there's certainly been a move to centralize um, services um, to get higher volumes and better results. So in the UK, for example, a lot of aneurysm surgery, which is what swellings of the, of the artery in, in, in the stomach, um, has been centralized. And some of the more complex aneurysm surgery um, has been further centralized into, into higher specialist units. Mm-hmm. And that's simply because if, if you're doing more, you're going to get better, better results. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you take, for example, 
um, someone who does ovarian or left testicular vein embolization or right testicular vein embolization or right ovarian vein embolization. It's, there are a generic set of skills that an interventional radiologist has. So it's slightly different, I think, in interventional radiology because we use our catheters and our wires to get into arteries and veins everywhere in the body. Mm -hmm. So actually, if someone asks me how many testicular vein embolizations I do a year, I probably only do three or four because I don't need to do them because I do a huge number of ovarian vein embolizations, which are, I know are effectively the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, because of that, I've got colleagues that do that and they, they specialize in that area. But of course, if someone's said to me, can you give me a hand? I'm struggling. I have no problem doing it because of course I, I like other people ha have got a generic set of skills where I can put wires and catheters and coils into veins. Mm -hmm. And therefore sometimes it's, it's not all about the, the number. Mm -hmm. um, I think when it comes to the internal iliac veins, again, it's probably a little bit more about the numbers there. Um, but my, my personal experience is it took me between 50 and 100 cases before I felt comfortable. And when I'm teaching other people, I feel as though it takes about 20 to 50 cases for people to become comfortable mm -hmm. in the internal iliac veins. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, now, of course, I'm quite fortunate that I do anywhere around about 100 or so cases a year. So it's, it's a very high number. Um, and it's something that you then can be, become so just more slick at slick is yeah. is probably the be the better word of word of doing it. You know, people who who do less may take say an hour and a half, two hours to do a case. I might take forty five minutes to an hour, but then that's because I've done a lot of numbers. Right. Um, so I, I take it sometimes with a with a pinch of salt but it's that it's that relationship you build up I think with a with any clinician when you start asking them questions yeah so just so to brag on you for a minute just so everyone knows <laughs> Beckett placed he placed 13 coils in my pelvis in 35 minutes <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I think I, I think my anxiety was forcing you to be a little bit quick <laughs> So, thank you. I don't know if that's a personal best for you or what. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting you say about the, the, the number, number of coils there as well, because I have heard some people talk about, oh, I can't believe someone put that number of coils in me. But I, I remember look, looking at the data just for, say, a single testicular vein embolization on the left in, in men. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I noticed there was a huge variation. Um, both in, in physicians who did it um, and between, and also the number of cases that that particular physician did themselves, there was a variation. And so you could have two coils placed in a, in a left testicular vein, but you could also have 12 coils placed in a left testicular vein. You know, the, the end result is the same. You're, mm -hmm. you're embolizing that one vein. So I don't necessarily think in those cases that the number of coils necessarily signifies any, any, anything really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was just impressed with how many you did in such a short amount. <laughs> that was, that's less than three minutes per coil. So, <laughs> um, and I, I do want to point out that a lot of American doctors there um, approach to pelvic vein embolization is to go through the groin um, and you take a jugular approach. Do you want to talk about why you do that? It's, it's, it's a straight line. Um, so it, it might be to do with what the, the clinicians there are planning on doing. So for example, if they're planning on just treating say an ovarian vein, then they will treat that as though it's a left testicular vein. And actually most people, when they learn to do testicular vein embolization, use the groin approach. Mm -hmm. um, 
whilst if you have to treat any of the other veins, there's a lot of bends to get into where you want. Whilst, of course, if you go from the jugular, it's a straight line in, into effectively all of, all of the territories that you need to treat. Um, and that means that it's going, to be, it's going to be less arduous to get where you need to be, which means that it will be less time to get to where you need to be, which will mean it'll be more comfortable for the patient. Yeah. Um, and it, again, it varies between clinicians and their experience, but I've personally found that uh, I'm more comfortable when you're getting to a certain point in embolization that the catheter and the wire will behave and the coil will behave better if everything's in a straight line rather than necessarily flick out and move, move coils and malplace coils, for example. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, and, and would you say, like, whenever we're talking left ovarian vein embolization versus iliac and ovarian vein embolization, is it more common for you to do the iliac veins and the ovarian, or is it more common for you to do just ovarian veins? We would treat all of the reflux together. Yeah. Okay. So we would, we, would, we would treat the ovarian and the internal ilia. Okay. Um, okay. What does recovery look like for the typical, typical, you know, very air quotes here, but what is recovery like after a pelvic vein embolization? A lot of people have asked me personally, can you feel them? Do you know they're in there? And the answer is no. Um, I'm, I'm at the point now where sometimes I forget that I have you know, metal in my body, but can you describe what your experience has been in all the cases that you've done, what a typical recovery looks like? So I'll describe a typical recovery um, and then I can describe an atypical recovery as well. Right. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that the, the typical recovery period is that you, you, you place the coils, the patient then goes home that afternoon, that evening, um, and they actually feel completely fine. Um, there's no problems. Um, and that in their head means that they're thinking, wow, this is fabulous. No issues whatsoever. Um, I feel great. But what tends to happen is they then wake up the following day and it's the following day where they then feel worse. Now, sometimes that can make them a little bit, patients a little bit concerned because they've had this period of, of feeling fine and then they get worse rather than you've done something, they feel a bit miserable and then they improve. Um, but that's entirely normal. And actually, sometimes it's not even until the day after. Um, and then what can happen is, is you get this, this aching and this cramping around the pelvic area, which can be like period pain. Mm -hmm. um, and typically, um, it can be associated with, in about a third of patients, with sort of flu, this flu-like mm -hmm. feeling, which we call post-embolization syndrome. Um, and that can be a low-grade temperature. It can be general sort of myalgia or ach aching in the muscles uh, just shortness of breath as well um, and, and some people just feel quite exhausted mm -hmm. um, now that should last about one to two weeks and then the patient should then improve and then their symptoms we would hope would then slowly improve after that now that's the the typical scenario now atypically and what you need to remember is that no matter what we're doing the fact that you walk out and there's a pinhole and you can't even see where we've been doesn't mean we haven't done anything inside your pelvis mm -hmm. so you've got inflammation within within the pelvis now if you had for example your appendix taken out and you looked at your scar where they'd cut into your tummy um, and you looked at that after two to four weeks, it would still look pretty red and raised. Mm -hmm. it, there's still inflammation there. Um, and actually, at a microscopic level, an inflammation will continue for months after mm -hmm. the procedure. So there is a variability in, in recovery in that some people, that inflammatory response to the pelvis can cause a more protracted recovery over a period of weeks or a couple of months. But the vast majority, 95%, you would expect to have, to have resolved within about one to two weeks after the post-embolization syndrome um, has disappeared. Okay. Yeah, so for me, I, I definitely experienced the, the flu-like, achy, 
um, we walked out of the Whiteley Clinic. Uh, my, we were hungry. My husband and I went over to Borough Market. We walked around Borough Market for probably four hours. I felt great. I ate Mexican food. I drank a margarita. I mean, it was, it was like, wow, I don't feel like I've had surgery at all. It was interesting that day. I, I even told my husband, I feel the soreness on my neck where he went in more than I feel anything in my pelvis. And then we got back to the flat that night and I took a hot bath. And about the time I was getting ready to go to bed it was when I was like, I don't feel that good. <laughs> so it was, you know, eight hours probably from, from the time that I, and then that night during the night, I didn't sleep very well because I was just aching all over and I was running a low grade temperature. And so I, I had the classic, it didn't last three or four weeks though. It lasted two days. And then on the third day I woke up, I felt good, but I felt tired and um, I, we went to Hyde Park that day and we ended up walking like six miles and that was three days after surgery. So I would say it was pretty, a pretty easy recovery to be truthful. Yeah, um, no, I'd agree. I think yours was. Yeah, but it's not yeah, like it was at the lower. No, it, it's not. It's yeah. not. So what would a, what would, what would be an example of something um, that could happen in recovery that would be of a concern to someone that would be a reason to call the doctor or go back in or something like that. So I think, I think shortness of breath, um, is it, it tends to be, it's just part of the flu like scenario and um, the, the exhaustion, mm -hmm. but I think shortness of breath is, is something to be concerned about. Um, you worry about car migration, um, pulmonary emboli that you, you can have with, with any form of surgery um, and, and I think you should always have have a clinician just examine you and, and make sure every, everything's fine um, I mean any, any questions in the post-operative period um, aren't, aren't silly questions um, yeah. we, we, get, we get a lot of phone calls is this normal yeah. um, and generally in the first couple of weeks anything goes Okay. Because of course, there's pe there's inflammation in the pelvis, so some people feel as though it, it, it hurts when they urinate. Um, you know, some people say, "Oh, I feel some lumps in the vulval area." Well, we might have used some sclerosin and, and injected in that area, so that might be why. I think in the first first few weeks, pretty much anything goes, um, but shortness of breath is something that we would we would just want to just make sure that there's nothing else going on. I think in that in that period. So you mentioned coil migration. I'm guessing that's not a very common scenario. Um, it, 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 it's, it's not uncommon, but it's certainly not common. Um, when you read the literature, it says it's about one to two times in a hundred, um, which actually is fairly common yeah. um, when you're doing a, a hundred a year. Um, now, so far, my not you know I've probably done 600 plus of these cases now um and I've not seen coil migration in my own cases that doesn't mean I've never had coil migration happen however um because coil migration per se in the majority of patients is is asymptomatic mm. so pe people don't even know that it's happened yeah um and you know suddenly they'll have a chest x-ray and there'll be a coil up here and people say yeah. whoa you know but I feel fine, you know, and then they've got this coil up here and then they're saying, well, take it out. And it's like, well, <laughs> what you really, you really want me to put a wire catheter through the heart, try and snare this thing out, get it out um, and potentially cause you more, pro more harm than, than good. Yeah. Um, or do you want to just leave it in? Cause we never even, you never even knew that it was there. Yeah. So I think it, it, it's, it, it generally is an asymptomatic event. And uh, that's not to say that, it, it, you know, you might not get symptoms if, if it occurs, but the majority that I've, I've seen or know about, um, it, was, it was asymptomatic when it occurred. So before anybody freaks out that who's had a pelvic vein embolization and they're thinking, oh my gosh, what if I have a migrated coil in my lung? Can you, just, can you explain why that's not necessarily a concern, especially if they're asymptomatic, because the coils are so tiny? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, the, 
it's it's not so much the size, but it's it's just the fact that the coil when it when it embeds it in itself. But so for example, the lung has got two two blood supplies mm -hmm. as well. You've got a pulmonary artery and a bronchial artery. Um, so it doesn't necessarily cause infarction and, and death to the to the tissue if the coil moves there. Um, and, and also, just the, once the coils are in, I would say it takes about a, a week or so for the coils to embed and mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, the spasm to occur. Uh, certainly several weeks down the line, these coils aren't going anywhere. Okay. They're, they're, they're not, they're not going to move. Um, and we know that because we've, we've tried to take them out in certain circumstances if patients may have uh, an allergy to the coil, for example, which is incredibly rare, incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. um, and they just, they, they don't come out, not the way they came in. Yeah. So the, uh, I'm glad you mentioned allergy to the coil. This wasn't in my list of questions for you because I've talked with Dr. Whiteley about this before. But my understanding is that one of the reasons you guys use the Cook coils, which are what I have, and they're the platinum, the platinum coils, is because people are much less likely to be allergic to platinum than they are to nickel. Is that correct? So, so, so actually, the all of the coil manufacturers per se, and um, the majority of the coils are made out of platinum. Okay. So there's, there's, there's roughly about 92% platinum in a coil. Um, and then the rest is sort of a tungsten um, and, and maybe some Dacron in there. And um, so tung tungsten in itself is obviously an element in the periodic table. Um, however, it's important to note that although 91, 92% of the coil is platinum and 8% is tungsten, the tungsten isn't necessarily, for whatever reason, manufactured pure. It has got traces, and I mean infinitely small traces, um, of, of nickel in there. Um, however, again, the mechanism by which a patient has an allergy on the skin is a completely different immunological response to if something is inside their body. So, for example, you could have a topical allergy to iodine on the skin, but the contrast that we inject for the procedure into the veins, which has got iodine in it, you will not react. So just because you have a topical reaction to, to say, the coil doesn't mean you would have an internal reaction. Although if someone was, was hyperallergenic, I would probably do some allergy testing and, and physically test for the coil. Now, of course... If you then have a reaction, a skin reaction to the coil, it doesn't mean that you'll have a reaction, like I said, internally, but it makes us a little bit more concerned. Okay. All right. Thanks for speaking to that. <laughs> um, okay. I went on Instagram and asked my audience if they had any questions for you. <laughs> I have several ladies who have uh, been on the journey of polycongestion syndrome, some of whom have received embolization, some of whom haven't. Uh, one of my friends on Instagram was actually supposed to come to London for you to do an embolization for her right before COVID-19 happened, and so her trip ended up getting canceled. <laughs> Um, so she's still waiting to meet you. Um, but I, I have some questions from readers, if it's okay if I ask. Yeah. Okay. So first question is, can embolization of the pudendal vein cause scarring that can lead to pudendal nerve pain? So I think it's really important in the onset here to say we don't know. Okay. We don't know the answer to that. Um, what we do know is that there are certainly case reports that are out there whereby actually patients have had pudendal nerve pain and they've had embolization of the veins, which has resulted in a reduction in their pudendal nerve pain. Okay. So in, in those situations, the venous plexus was pressing on the, on the pudendal nerve and by embolizing the pudendal vein, um, either the pudendal vein, or I think it was the ovarian vein in the case report, their symptoms improved. So there's certainly evidence to suggest the opposite to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. However, um, I think my, my personal feeling is that I think it does exist that whereby you're placing coils in veins that are nearby nerves, there may be an 
irritation of a nerve and that may be one of the causes of post embolization pain that either increases or persists okay it may not be necessarily the scarring itself okay. it may simply be the the physical effect of the coil but in in saying this this is anecdotal this is non-evidence based and i've certainly not seen any case reports and not had any physical feedback from people where by where we think this may have occurred okay and before we go any further um i, I do want to just tell everyone um dr beckett is not your doctor so don't take any of this as medical advice you're responsible for your own healthcare and for finding a practitioner of your choice to ask these questions to this is for informational purposes only um he is my doctor but he's not yours <laughs> So I just want to absolutely, and of course, there there may be a hundred and one different reasons For why sure. someone's pain gets worse after a procedure. For it sure. may be their their um, original pain that's just getting worse over time. It may be that they've developed something else, and so it's very important um, all the time to to seek that advice from your personal clinician. Sure, absolutely. All right, next question. Uh, how can a patient bring up iliac vein embolization if the doctor they have found or were referred to, as you know, in the United States, we have this very crazy referral system where insurance is involved and insurance doesn't always cover things. And so sometimes the doctor you get referred to is literally the only one that you can see that's paid for by your insurance. So if a person is referred to an interventional radiologist who only specializes or only knows how to do ovarian vein embolization, how can they bring up, well, what about my iliac veins too? Because I'm concerned because the literature suggests that the iliac veins are very often involved in uh, pelvic congestion syndrome. I think pretty much as you've just said. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, and, and of course, I think, I think there's this, there's this um, assumption that with a lot of people that actually you're, you're going to a clinician to be told what you're going to have done. Mm -hmm. um, when in actual fact, it's, it's a two-way two -way process. Yeah. Um, and, I, and actually what, what you're going for is you're going to get advice and you're going to um, hopefully get some of your concerns alleviated mm -hmm. um, and you're going to want to know what's going to happen after. Now it might be that someone says you're going to have left ovarian vein embolization. That's fine. Okay. But after, what if I've still got pain, for example, you know, what, how, how are we going to manage it? What, what are we going to look at next? And yeah. I think there, there shouldn't be this boundary whereby at any point you feel as though you shouldn't ask questions. Doctors love people who ask questions, okay? <laughs> we love it because actually a lot of people don't ask questions and, and, and therefore, I don't, I don't want to say it's boring. It's not boring, but I mean, we, we, we want to feel that engagement in the process. At the end of the day, um, you know, we're, doing, we're going to be doing something on your body um, and you need to be engaged in that. Um, and also you, you need to be aware that if things don't go well, that we you know we've had that discussion yeah there are those poss there, there are those possibilities yeah um so to sit there and say i'm going to do this there's a hundred percent success that's it it is not is not a good con con consultation to be having yeah um i think it's 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 a two-way process it's a re all about the relationship between the doctor and the patient and then moving forward yeah. don't be afraid to ask questions we love it <laughs> i think i think I don't know how much experience you have with the American medical system, David. But no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hate to break it to you, but most American doctors do not like us to ask questions. They, they like to be the expert in the white coat, and we are submitting ourselves to them as you here fix me. And um, I, in fact, the interventional radiologist I saw here in the United States, I showed up with a notebook full of studies and questions and all of that. And he kind of rolled his eyes at me because I was questioning his expertise. So 
I appreciate you saying that. And this, this is why I refer anyone who asks me about pelvic congestion, this is why I refer them to you and Dr. Whiteley, because I know that you are good with patients advocating for themselves and educating themselves and asking questions. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I've, I've, I've not, not had complications after, after any procedure. Yeah. And I think, and I think that's important to realize you know, even though sometimes these risks might be one in 200, one in 300, one in 500, heck, some, some risks are one in 1,000. When they happen, it, that's a number. When it happens to you as a patient, yeah. it doesn't matter that it's one in 1,000 anymore. It, it, it's, it's you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for saying that. All right, next question. Um, does getting a pelvic vein embolization increase the chance of new varicose veins? So the answer is no, because actually by treating all of the reflux, you're re reducing your chance of having further reflux. Uh, what would increase your likelihood, for example, of developing more pelvic varicosities would be subsequent pregnancies. Okay. That would be a risk factor for a recurrence. Okay. And I'm glad you brought up pregnancy. Um, a lot of women think or are told that they need to go ahead and have kids before their embolization because it's not possible to get pregnant after. Is that true? Uh, absolutely not. There is no evidence out there to suggest that pelvic vein embolization has any impact on fertility um, or childbirth. I would obviously mention it to your gynecologist obstetrician mm -hmm. that you've had coils placed because mm -hmm. clearly if you needed a cesarean section, it's just so they're, they're aware of that. Um, but it, it, it shouldn't reduce your, your chances at all Okay, is the answer to that. Good, good. I'm glad you cleared that up. <laughs> okay, what, all right, so you, you did mention following up earlier, and I had someone specifically, she's had a pelvic vein embolization uh, in Australia, not in the United States, and the she only had her left ovarian vein embolized, and the interventional radiologist she saw uh, did no follow-up whatsoever with her. No follow-up ultrasound, no follow-up exam. Basically just said, if things get worse, um, come back and see me. So what is the best way to follow up with patients after their procedure to make sure the coils have actually stopped the reflux? And what about doctors who say that follow-up ultrasounds aren't necessary? So, so certainly we, we do a clinic follow-up at six, six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and we also do a check um, transvaginal and transabdominal scan to make sure the reflux is gone. Um, our rationale for that is clearly that if the patient has ongoing symptoms, how do you know if those symptoms are related to persisting reflux or something else? So to truly rule out pelvic congestion, you need to show that theoretically all the reflux now has gone yeah, and that their symptoms have gone. Now, obviously that's fantastic. If you show that there is, if the patient comes rather than still got symptoms, how do you know that their symptoms aren't related to a technical failure of the procedure? And you'll only know that by scanning the patient to show that the reflux is gone. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously if the reflux is still there, that could be a reason why they've got persisting symptoms. If the reflux is gone and the patient's got persisting symptoms, then it may be that it's something else causing it. Or we need to look at the internal iliac veins, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it's important. Um, there may be some cases whereby I might understand not necessarily doing a transvaginal scan. For mm -hmm. example, if you'd done a scan and you knew that there was no iliac vein reflux, and you knew there was no right ovarian vein re reflux, and it was a single left ovarian vein, generally speaking, if you put the coils in that, you're going to get a, a good technical result. And I think if that mirrors a good clinical result, then I would understand perhaps leaving it in that situation. But I think certainly it, it's a good idea to document the, the technical success of your procedure and then compare it to the clinical state of the patient. Okay. So better safe than sorry. It's good to follow up. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, another question. Does stenting May Turner syndrome cause um, persistent genital arousal disorder? No idea in okay. terms of the evidence on this one. Okay. What I would say is that if you've got a narrowing, and this is anecdotally completely, um, and thinking about the physiology, but if you've got a narrowing of your common iliac vein, you'll have more flow through your internal iliac veins. So you'll have this hyperdynamic circulation and congestion within the iliac veins. That, in my eyes, is more likely to, to cause persistent general arousal. And therefore, by stenting, you would reduce that, I would have thought. But this, it's, it, it's an evidence-free zone as far as I'm aware, and it's not my specialty at all, and it's not something that I personally see. Um, but, but thinking of the physiology, that's what, that's what I would have assumed. So then is it, is it possible that iliac vein reflux can cause persistent genital arousal? I mean, when you, when you get... Um, and um, what, I'm, what I'm essentially trying to do here is I'm trying to draw similarities mm -hmm. um, in the body to, to explain um, when this isn't my necessarily area of, of speciality. Sure. But certainly in the legs, if you've got reflux in the legs, you get inflammation. And where you've got inflammation with reflux, you've got oversensitivity. Mm -hmm. So... It wouldn't be something that would surprise me if you had reflux within the pelvis that you had oversensitivity. Okay. And then this is from the same person. She, she does have a Mayturner stent. So uh, does a Mayturner stent on one side cause pressure or pain on the other side? And I, and I, I thought about this question and I, I think the only way I could see that it would is because where the, the iliac veins meet, you don't simply place the stent so it's purely in the left side. You actually place it so the stent is hanging a little bit over the opposite side. So you have got a piece of metal, therefore, that is in the center, low back area, that's exerting radial force. So because of that, it wouldn't be surprising to, if someone said again, I can actually feel some discomfort on both sides. But what I would have thought would happen with time is that actually that pain should reduce because the nerves that are, are around the adventitial area of, of the vein and the vessels will get used to that, that stretching. Okay. So that might happen short term, but I think chronic and long-term effects should be that you don't feel the stent anymore. Okay. And then the last reader question that I have is anything related to pelvic congestion, whether it's pelvic congestion syndrome itself, having an embolization done, um, pelvic pain, etc. are the coils or pelvic congestion syndrome made worse depending on the point of the month that a woman is at in her cycle? So the, the pe pelvic congestion pain is cyclical. Um, we certainly see that. And we certainly see that when we do transvaginal scanning, that patients that are actually on their period at the time mm -hmm. may have worse, worse reflux um, when the sonographers scan that patient. Mm -hmm. So increased blood flow around the time of menstruation, certainly. Can. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Well, that is all the questions I have for you, David. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that you feel is important for someone who's trying to find an interventional radiologist? Um, no, no. I think just, just, just ask a lot of questions. Um, feel comfortable. Um, and... And actually, you know, we are, we are here to try and do our best for the patient, obviously. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm so thankful. Um, every day, I'm so thankful that 
I educated myself and read studies and found the Whiteley Clinic and had the opportunity to meet you. And um, I, I'm one of your success stories. So I appreciate that. Good to hear. Yes. <laughs> yes. I will say I do still have, you know, people ask me quite a bit, are you 100% pain free? No, I'm not. But what I would say if I have pain now, um, I think that it's not because I, because I, since I've come home from London, I've had sonograms and things because I thought maybe I had an ovarian cyst or thought I was having some uterine fibroids or something like that. So I've, I've followed up and had some other ultrasounds done here. I don't have any ovarian cysts. I don't have any fibroids. I don't have endometriosis, adenomyosis. I don't have any of these things going on, but I stu still have some pelvic pain sometimes. And so what I tell people is, I obviously have no idea where that pelvic pain is coming from, but I know that all pain is actually in the brain. And, you know, because our nervous system tells us we're in pain. That's, that's our brain. And knowing that I've had my pelvic veins taken care of, I've ruled out endometriosis and adenomyosis and cysts and fibroids and all of the things, that there really is no pathology in my pelvis to speak of. For me, it's just about my body has to, and my brain has to get the message that it's safe now and it can unlearn to feel that pain. And I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but that's, that's it, where I'm at. No, it, it does make sense. And I think that's a really important thing to, to get over is that, is that one, sometimes these procedures don't work and people are still in pain. Um, obviously, I'm glad we've, we've managed to reduce your pain greatly, um, but you, you do bring up the other valid point, of course, which is that actually pain is, when we're not saying your pain is, psych or not you in particular, but we're not saying a patient's pain is, is psychological, right. but, what, but you know, there's, there's always a cause for pain. However, you know, sometimes we have to look at how to manage the pain. Yep. Um, and, and it seems as though you're, you're, you're definitely in the right place now. Yeah. I, and it's not even now it's, it's just annoying. Sometimes it's just like, Oh, there it is again. You know, it just reminds me that, that I've had this experience in my life and, but it, it hasn't kept me from doing anything that I want to do. And, you know, um, this time last year, whenever I was first meeting you and chatting with you and Mark about coming over, um, I have been unable to even go for walks because just getting out of bed and walking around was so painful and uncomfortable. And I, I came home in, in June um, after you did my surgery. And that month I was bent over working in my garden, shoveling dirt, going swimming, going for walks, hiking, doing all. And that was within a week of having surgery done. So, um, I am grateful that I had it done and I'm grateful that, that you're who did it for me. And, um, now whatever minor annoying pain I have, I just, I call it phantom pain. Cause I'm like, there's really nothing there. There's really nothing wrong. Um, and my brain just has to unlearn how to feel that. So I'm grateful. Thank you so much for your time today and for explaining all of this really technical medical stuff to lay people. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate it and um i'm gonna stop the recording and if you want to just hang on for a second we can yeah. finish up. okay thank you